Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on this week's podcast, we've got somebody that knows how to raise the money. But before we talk to our guests, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, you know him, you love him, the brain, the professor, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek, learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm a little intimidated by our guest. Let's just get into it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm intimidated by you guys. You guys uh, really know how to do a lot of things that I don't. Well, well, we'll we'll see about that. Today's guest is Omar Khan from BoardwalkWealth.com. Uh, Boardwalk Wealth is a private equity firm located in beautiful Dallas, Texas. They connect passive investors to multifamily real estate opportunities of B and C class properties with value add potential, and uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So well, Omar Khan, board. yeah, I can tell you that. How the heck did you get started with uh, a private equity firm? Walk well, us through your entrepreneurial journey. Well, uh, it's it's kind of uh, not as exciting as you think it is. I worked for 10 plus years uh, on the corporate finance investment banking side, both on the sell and buy side, which basically is a fancy way of saying I was both advising on assets, assets, buying assets, structuring assets, structuring deals, and then actually going to buy them on the other side as well. So I did that for a little while. And then my family... Um, uh, I mean, they're fairly financially sophisticated. They've owned a lot of commercial real estate. Um, this is not their main business. It's just where they park their money over the years, right? So growing up, I had a lot of those sort of, uh, you know, experiences as well, actually negotiating. I mean, not me directly, but, you know, my dad, my uncles negotiating with bankers and actually being the GCs and, you know, while they were running their other businesses. So I kind of had experiences, interestingly enough, both from the institutional side as well as the entrepreneurial side. And I moved down to the U.S. four years ago. And when I moved down, I realized, I mean, I was, what, 31? Yeah, 31 at the time. And I realized that, um, again, I moved from Canada, and I realized, okay, my taxes are somewhat similar. I mean, they're slightly less, but they're not that less, right? And I get, I get no health care. I get none of the other stuff. So why am I paying so much money in taxes, right? What's going on? And by that that's time- That's a good question, by the way. I mean, and then I realized that is one of the most American questions I could have ever asked. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, we started, I, I ported over a lot of my contacts, basically from Canada. I've lived in Dubai, Pakistan as well, went to an international school. So I have lots of friends all over the world and they're all fairly affluent, right? So I ported over a lot of those contacts. And then when I moved to Dallas, one of my really good family friends of ours, they have a big family office out of Toronto they were restructuring a big office portfolio in Houston because they want to pass it on to the next generation and all that sort of stuff. So my buddy gives me a call out of the blue and he's like, look, we've got this $200 million office portfolio. We want to restructure it. I'm going out of Houston. Why don't you show up? And I had nothing going on and he's one of my closest friends. So I decided to go down and you know, you do one deal and then you do another deal and you know, you know how it is, right? You do a good enough job and more people know you and more people know you. And one of the things that I tell people is that, at the pace at which I've scaled, this would not have been ha possible in any other country except the US. I mean, not just say the amount of assets, but the amount of fact that people are so entrepreneurial, it's just go, go, go. Let's go get it done. Let's do the right deal. Let's make some money. So I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very Texas thing. It's, it's always bigger and faster in Texas. Is it? I, see, because now yeah. in Florida and Georgia as well, and I, can, I, I don't know what it is, because again, lots of investors from different countries. And I can tell you like, it's a lot of times what I feel like the difference between American investors and other investors is look, if you want to do it, you'll do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't waste time. It's like, hey, yay or nay, and move on, right? Whereas with a lot of international investors, it always seems like people take forever to make up their mind, which look, right. it can be good or bad. I'm not saying it's always good. It's always bad, but I'm just saying that's a characteristic, right? And I feel like optimism and intensity and pace is actually a better strategy than hoping and praying for like the deal of the century to come by. Right. 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 So Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot there, right? Like, you know, I think that one, um, 
we sometimes forget who our network is, right? Like, and that's a, that's a big thing is, you know, you got to leverage the network whichever way you can. And um, the, the second piece behind that is really, um, I'd be interested to know, like uh, Omar, like a lot yeah. of people, you, you say family office and everybody thinks of like, you know, money coming out the walls, right? Like, for like people, yeah, yeah, for people that like don't that. know a family yeah. office is like the investment branch of a wealthy family. Yeah. Okay. Like that's what the family office is. But like everybody and their brothers beating down the door to get to the family office for their investments. How do you do it? It doesn't work like that. Look, a lot of it's really funny. Uh, again, working on the institutional side, I keep, you know, again, because I have to promote my brand as well, obviously, like a lot of other people. So, you know, my marketing guys out there on all social media and otherwise as well, we go to events and it's kind of funny and slash endearing when I hear people say, oh, I have a family office. I was like, bro, first of all, there's a lot of pieces that require into you dealing with somebody of that sophistication. It's not just the money because look, a lot of people have money. You need to have your reporting in order. You need to have good systems. You need to have a bench strength. You can't be some one random Joe blow off the street, no matter how good your deal is. And people are just going to give you money because when sophisticated pools of capital are looking to place money, they're not just looking at the deal. They're looking at things like, Hey, how good is this person's bench strength? How good is the organization? Are they a real organization or is this some guy out of a coffee shop? Right? Yes or no? I mean, but that's just the perception. That's just the way. How good is the reporting? Do they have the reports audited? Do they have a CPA on? You know, there's a lot of things like that that go into place that have nothing to do with the actual quality of the deal. And then on top of that, a lot of this is relationship heavy. So the first deal, it's like you're pulling teeth, right? But by the time you get to your second, third, fourth deal, you don't, you don't necessarily have to pull teeth as much. But it's very relationship driven. And it doesn't happen like you're some guy on Facebook posting memes and suddenly a family guy office is gonna just, you know, give you money because you sound like a cool guy. Stuff doesn't work like that. Yeah, and I know Mark, that, I mean, that, yeah. Go ahead, lot, I mean, a lot of people think that way, right? Like a lot of people think, oh man, all I gotta do is send this, this fantastic deal. Because one of the things that you hear all the time is, go find the deal and, you'll find and the, the money. money's there, right? But like, it's not always there, is it? Hey, but my retort to that is, man, look, I can find you a hundred million dollar deal. Can you show up with $80 million? Okay, let's go, man. And you show up because I can tell you, you can't. Because if you could show up at $80 million, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation over Zoom, which is typically where the conversation ends. <laughs> <laughs> so Omar, what's, what's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? Look, I think it's really funny. Again, before I moved to the U S I didn't even know they were real estate mentors uh, of this type, number one. And again, I'm a lifelong learner. So I'm always, Hey, if somebody can give me a tip, I'm all for it, man. But what's really funny is it's a case of these days. I feel a lot of times uh, a case of the blind leading the blind. So I see guys who are talking about mentorship and masterminds. I'm like, bro, you haven't even done a deal in the past five years. What are you talking about, man? You can't even build a financial model. You can't even model out your returns. What are you talking about? And you know what's funny? I thought, well, that, that's quite self-evident, right? Why? Well, it turns out I'm the moron because there's people beating down other people's doors in the hope that they have some magic potion that they're going to drink and suddenly money's going to fall from the sky. And yeah, I mean, you guys know this, your experience, things don't work out like that, right? It's a lot of blood, sweat and tears, a lot of false starts and you can do everything right and nothing works and everything wrong and everything works. It's a lot of those sort of things, right? Well, yeah, we, we, we see the false profits all the time and it, it makes us pull our hair out. In fact, Scott had a ton of hair until about a year ago. <laughs> so he pulled it all out or you see? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's just what happens. So. Look, I mean, I think Texas. I think Texas is also the ground zero for things. I think hope springs eternal uh, in Texas, and uh, there's lots of people, man. I mean, I thought, why would you pay thirty, fifty thousand dollars, whereas you could just go invest in somebody's deal and kind of learn, right, and try to make money along the way? And it turns out I'm the dummy. Uh, there are people out there who are willing to max out their credit cards, do really dumb things, in the hope that they will find that one magic trick that's going to make them a millionaire overnight. Right, right. So who, who is a good sort of buyer persona for your services? 
Are oh, they an accredited I've done, investor? Yeah, that... I've, I've done a lot of work on that because we have to, yeah. we have to really focus on. So for me, it's typically an accredited investor. Typically it's a male, but now it's 80, 20 male, female now, right? But typically it's an accredited investor. They're in their mid forties. They are, they have invested before. So they understand at least they, they have an idea of what's going on. Nobody's saying they have to know everything, right? And the other deal also is that they are sophisticated enough that they can run their own numbers themselves. But again, this doesn't mean they always run their numbers themselves, right? This means that if they chose to do it, they would do it. This gives me, this gave me a lot of comfort in the sense that people are coming from a position of knowledge and experience. So when you're having a conversation with them, what I felt is it's a more deeper conversation. And that investor isn't a one and done type investor. That investor is an investor, A, that's a repeat investor, and they also give you more money. So it's not like, hey, I'll give you 50 grand or 75 grand once a year. No, I'll give you 250 grand five times a year. Right, right. So, you know, Scott and I see this all the time. Um, we're accredited investors and everybody has, it feels like, their own fund. And we're looking at, you know, we'll see, you know, 8% pref, 50% of the profits, management fee, um, you know, and maybe the average return, Scott, would be 20 to 30%. Is that Yeah, but they're right? saying it's 20 to 30, right? It's not a piece of paper. Right, right. Well, like that's, there's, uh, yeah, that's you yeah, know, but they, yeah, they're, paper, right? I mean, it's not reality. They're track record. So, so for Scott and I, or the listeners who might be accredited investors, what are, what are the realistic expectations of doing a multifamily deal where there's value add, we can be a passive investor. How long, what would be our pref interest rate? And then what would be, how long before the fund unwinds, we get our money back? What, what would that really look like from 30,000 feet? So typically? look, I can tell you at least we're just in bigger cities. Uh, so, so I'll tell you the cities we're in. San Antonio, Austin, Jacksonville, Atlanta, right? And I have a partner in Dallas. We look, I mean, I live there, but we just haven't been able to find the right deal in Dallas, even though it's a great market. The point I'm trying to make is we're in bigger markets, right? So we're at this stage of the cycle, we're looking at basically mid-teens and low mid-teens IRR is a realistic game. Now, what will happen is the first thing every, you tell investors everything is like, look, this invest, this return is just on a piece of paper. It doesn't really mean anything. Because what means is the assumptions behind it, are they reasonable? Because you can tweak one or two assumptions and really make your numbers look really nice, right? Investors, the first thing, even after you give them this entire speech, you explain it to them, they say, hey, I was like, do you understand? Yes. First thing they ask is, how much are the returns? And you're like, dude, you gotta understand what goes into this. Because as soon as you say how much are the returns, you know what a sponsor does? Now they know that you're only looking at one number. So they'll jack around with their assumptions to make, to basically fit a square peg through a round hole, right? So if you're realistic these days, typically, I don't know what happened to my camera right there. Okay. So if you're realistic these days in the bigger cities, if it's a true value add, because those are getting hard to find in the multifamily space and we're in the B space, you're looking at low, low to mid teens IRR, 8% prep is very doable but cash on cash has to be around 80 and a half. That is realistic with a good sponsor. Now what happens typically is when you're not a good sponsor or you're jacking around with the numbers, you'll show really high cash on cash, really high investor returns. But when you're in the deal, then you realize you're not getting any distributions on time, all that other stuff is starting to happen. So. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Omar, did you say 18 and a half percent? No, cash I cash? said eight, eight to eight and a half percent cash on cash. Give or so, take. I mean, that, that's after stabilization, by the way, once you've stabilized it, right? Right. Okay. All right. So 8% eight, 8 preferred and like an 8 to 8.5% eight cash, cash on cash. cash. Okay. But that's being realistic in the B space right now in these bigger cities because you've got to realize the go go years, the Wild West right after the crash, that's done. Because a lot of these properties have been picked over twice or thrice, and all the brokers and everybody will tell you, well, you can take it to the next level. And the point is, what were the other four guys in the last five years doing? I mean, were they chopped liver? Were they, were they not doing anything? Because yeah, you can put granite, say countertops, but if your tenant makes like $30,000 a year, how are they gonna pay for this? Right? right. I mean, yeah, you can take it to the next level. Nobody's gonna pay you. Right, right. So, so just kind of walk us through, you're looking at buying at a cap rate of so for these these type of properties, I'm looking at anywhere between four and a half to five and a half. Okay, four and a half to five and a half percent. Yeah. So 
just for the listeners, we just define real quickly what the cap rate means. So the cap rate is basically the net operating income divided by the purchase price. Now, where it gets interesting, if you know accounting is that the net operating income can mean a lot of things. So you really have some, just because somebody's saying they have a net operating income of X, in reality, doesn't necessarily mean they have a net operating income of X because they can be playing accounting tricks. They can be doing this, they can be doing that. So that's where you have to be really careful. And that's where a lot of folks who don't understand accounting, don't understand the operations behind certain things, that's where they don't pick up the nuances and they get into these deals where on paper, these deals look really good. But when you get into it, you realize, oh, there's a reason why the last guy didn't upgrade everything because my tenant base sucks and they're not going to pay me a dime. In fact, they're behind on all their payments. So why would you go? But you know, the marketing is, hey, all you got to do is show up at five or $6,000 a unit. You keep throwing it into this money pit and money starts coming out after six months. I mean, it's like any other business. My point is, if you don't know what you're doing, it's like any other business in the world, you're going to get your ass handed to you. Right, right. So, so Scott puts a million dollars in. Yeah. He's, he's going to look at a cash on cash return, realistically, of eight, eight and a half percent over what period of time before that fund so this unwinds? Is, this is uh, annual. So typically, typically an industry convention is that you're holding on, you're underwriting to a five-year hold, right? So you're underwriting or you're targeting a five-year hold. But this is when, for instance, if you're doing value add deals, so you're coming and doing a lot of heavy lifting. After about year two, maybe two and a half, depending on the size of the property, the bulk of the heavy, the 99% of the heavy lifting is done, right? So then this is something that most sponsors don't tell you, but you got to realize if the deal is structured the right way, 80 to 90% of any sponsor's total compensation in the deal, by the way, I'm a sponsor, is when we sell because that's when we make the real bulk of our money. So all these sponsors who tell you I'm a long-term buy and hold invest buyer, whatever, whatever they want, that's all BS. You have to completely call BS on them because from year two or two and a half, if they're hitting their numbers and performa, their hair is on fire trying to sell this. Because look, you make 80 to 90% of your comp. Why would you delay that comp for three years for no reason? Because you can take that money and plow it into a different deal. But everybody underwrites to a five-year hold just because they want to be safe. But you're really trying to get out in years two, three at most. Scott, Todd, what are your thoughts? No, you know, it's been kind of an eye-opening conversation here because ultimately what you realize is that one, you, you really have to take, um, you have to take the advice or the, the numbers or the marketing materials that you're getting from people and really in a way, just take that for just one second, suspend the numbers and really go back to the operator, right? Yeah. Like who is the operator? Are they credible? Like, do they know what they're doing? Like, you know, like there's too many people out there that, you know, the false prophets, if you will, or whatever, that just, oh, they, they, they went to a weekend seminar. Next thing you know, they're, they're presenting this deck of a hypothetical. They've got no real world experience. And then they're coming to you saying, hey, give me some money. And the numbers look good. And, and then hey, just distract. to add to that point, I would much rather, especially on this size, the look, every size deal we're doing is like 25, 30 million, right? I would much rather have somebody who, for instance, did, I mean, cur only cursory new real estate, didn't really know real estate that much, but was a stone cold killer in accounting, probably a CPA, versus somebody who's a real estate guy, but has no clue about accounting. Because at this level, you gotta understand accounting inside out, okay? You gotta understand how to make your numbers look right or wrong, depending on what you're doing, <laughs> right? And if you don't understand it, your lenders will eat you up alive, your vendors will eat you up alive, your property management team will eat you up alive, and you will have no idea what's going on. Because well, there's just man. so many, what? I'm your man, man, because I got that accounting locked and loaded. Hey man, you know accounting, I can tell you this. I'm, I've taken so many bets with people. I'm like, dude, give me a guy who knows accounting, he will kill a person who knows real estate within six months. There you yeah. go, man, it's the ninja move. <laughs> But there somebody who just knows real estate, they, they're going to get slaughtered these days because it's becoming so sophisticated now. So, so yeah. Omar, if, if I'm listening to this and I'm not strong on the accounting side, I'm not strong on the number side, is there a book? Is there some, something you would recommend as far as, okay, here's how you're going to learn your real estate numbers so that when you do have a conversation with a sponsor, you can have an intelligent conversation. Here's the questions that you're going to want to ask. Well, first of all, look, uh, books, there's one... Uh, Getting the name. Oh yeah, 
there's a book, a book called by, from Peter Lineman. I'm forgetting. He's a professor at Wharton. He's a real. He was or is. I don't know if he's dead or not. Uh, at Wharton, a real estate professor. It, he's got this blue textbook. Now, trust me, when I say textbook, it sounds boring and it's extremely boring, but it beats losing 100 grand any day, right? <laughs> so read that. There's another guy, I think he's another professor at Rutgers. His name is Frank Gallinelli or something. He's got some book called like 35 real estate metrics or something like that. I mean, that's not, that's not bad material because you understand what, what those metrics are at least. So I would suggest you start off there, but look, there are other resources like uh, on YouTube. If you YouTube, hey, how to build a financial model, right? You don't have to know Excel. I mean, you learn everything on. All you got to do is have the willing willingness to sh just shut yourself in a room for say 30 minutes a day, realistically shut off your phone, put yourself in a room for 30 minutes a day for three months in a row. That's it. You do that, I assure you, you will know 99.9% .9 of what you need to know. And that's it. You don't need to go do my job. You just need to know how to protect your own money. That's it. Omar, let's just play devil's advocate. Let's yeah. say that I'm a, I'm a successful uh, neurosurgeon yeah. and, I'm, and I'm doing procedure after procedure. I'm exhausted. I don't have time oh, uh, to, you're to learn this. No, no, no. If you're a successful neurosurgeon, you 100% already feel that you know everything. <laughs> okay, right. So, so at that point, is there an advisory service? Sort of like, you know, nobody knows if they have a good dentist yeah. until another dentist looks in their mouth and say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good crown. Mark, is I'm there gonna be honest with you, there, there's not. And I'll tell you why there's not. not. The reason why there isn't is because when it comes to money, everybody's a vulture. I'll be honest. Everyone's a vulture. Everybody, everybody's looking out for their interest. So like you might develop uh, trust over a period of time, but you're not going to get trust out of the box. So you, it's your money at the end of the day. Nobody's saying you got to know everything. You just need to know enough to know when you're being screwed. That's it. You don't need to go do my job. You don't need to do your job. You just need to know when the fish is smelling rotten. That's it. You all know? right. Well, and you can dig deeper and find people or hire somebody and all of that sort of stuff. But at least you got to know something is off. If you don't even know that, you better not invest your money first. You better take a step back you know, spend about say a month just reading a book on your downtime, you know? No, I love it. And Scott Todd, I think we have a podcast title. How to know when this fish smells bad. <laughs> or rotten, rotten. Or if I, I don't know when the fish smells rotten. Oh, so fish smells rotten. So um, Omar, this has been really, really enlightening. Um, the mentorship has been really valuable. But now we're at that point in time where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, another tip of the week, yeah. a website, a resource, maybe another book where the Art of Passive Income listeners can go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Look, uh, there's two or three of the websites. Number one, you can always use the U.S. Census. I love the U.S. Census data because a, it's free. B, you've already paid for it through your taxes. And C, well, it's not free, but you paid for it through your tax. And it's got and pretty much all other resources that you see online, they're building off of the U.S. Census. So pretty much all other stuff you see, it's building off the U.S. Census. So U.S. Census always helps. There's uh, free sites like city-data.com. I don't know if you know about it. You probably know about sure. it, right? So Bestplaces.net. Cool. Yeah, bestplaces.net. You can even go to this website, niche, N-I-C-H-E.com. The only reason why I like it is because it's got better graphics. That's the only reason. It sounds like a really stupid reason to like something, right? Because city data just gives you so much information that you're like, whoa, I'm drinking off of fire hose, right? Uh, you're probably a Mac guy if you if you care about graphics no i'm not a mac guy. i'm gonna be honest with you i live and breathe in excel all day long and i my god i i i just hate macs i just want to break macs so every time i see them surface are you a surface user no i mean i look i am a windows user i don't really care what you use i have a lenovo but that's because i'm boring uh but I like the lenovo. hey go, all Mark. i'm saying is if you want to do anything productive in life you cannot use a mac that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> you know. uh, all right well, you want to be a respectable member of society and be like the rest of us should not be in the mac that's all I'm okay well i think <laughs> while the two of you eat operating system gruel the rest of us are really going to enjoy our lives and how, um, how? when apple while, puts while you, you guys in a sandbox, when apple puts you, you in know. a sandbox and doesn't let you be the person you want to be while you guys crunch your funny. excel numbers i'll give you that i'll give you excel is way better on a PC than a Mac. That is about it. Anyways, I don't want to go into this because Scott Todd is really enjoying this. 
in a way that is just hurting me. Okay. So Scott, what's your tip of the week besides have Omar on the podcast every week? Yeah, exactly. We just need to take what he just said and like chunk it so I can insert it. Okay. Like just that piece, but check out nvideo.io. nvideo.io. It's, I've been using it now for, uh, I don't know, about six months. It's really cool because uh, they have all kinds of uh, graphic, uh, video graphic things that, that are in the cloud. You pop in your videos, you overlay your text, you see the social media graphics all the time, you know, stuff flying around the screen. I, I think this is a cool product, nvideo.io. I'm going to look it up free? right now. Is it free? No. Well, okay, good. good things in life are not free. Exactly. That, see, now, Omar, you're speaking that Mac language. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about uh, multifamily investing. Uh, you know, if you're one of those people that um, just want to passively get a nice return on your investment, and really, this is a, a great way to get into multifamily. And you just from listening to Omar, you know, he's going to help you and guide you. Just go to boardwalkwealth.com. Uh, it's gonna be a great place to start. And, you know, he's got access to prepare partners with a track record of, of these large scale investments, best in class property managers, tax and law specialists and foreign investing. Omar is your man, even though he loves the PC. Hey, that, that's how you know I'm going to make you money because nobody who's making money working in finance is using a Mac. I can tell you that. <laughs> no one. All right. Straight up. I'm going to put this a challenge to America. All right, there you go. I want to thank the listeners. I want to remind you the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like an Omar Khan from BoardWalkWealth.com is you can do us three little favors. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit course, as well as a new wholetailing course, How to Double Your Money, 30 Days or Less. Today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Go up that land investing mountain with your Sherpa, Scott Todd. 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Omar Khan, are we good? We're good. Scott Todd, are we good? Mark, we're great. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one, guys. Thank you so much for Take having care. me. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Have a good one. Bye.